Tomorrow is Pentecost Sunday. And I thought we must, must look at this scripture to understand what is happening in the world today. Verse 28, Joel chapter 2, and it shall come to pass afterward. The afterward more than 2,000, 3,000 years ago is today. In the end times, afterward, what is God going to do? I will pour my spirit on all flesh. All flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. What is prophecy? Prophecy is to speak forth the word of God. He wants all of us to speak forth the oracles of God, to speak into lives, to speak the word of God, to speak the promises of God, the grace of God. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. When I ask some people, when you pray, do you see anything? They see pictures. Visions and dreams and pictures are the language of the Holy Spirit. He speaks in all ways, in diverse manners, but your dreams, your visions, your pictures, that is how He speaks to us. And we must become increasingly familiar and familiar. And I will show wonders in the heavens and there will be blood and fires and pillars of song. We're seeing that today from the blood moons two, three years ago, 2015, and look at all the happenings in the world. Perilous times. We must pull up our socks. We must have a dream. We must have a vision. What are we living for? There must be a sense of urgency. There must be a sense of destiny. There must be a sense of purpose as to why we live our lives. Yes, we enjoy life. We go on holidays. We enjoy the comforts that God has given us. Enjoy all that. But underlying that and leading us on, church, we must have a sense of urgency, purpose, and destiny. What is going to happen in verse 32? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. At this conference, we hear reports of evangelism of the harvest from China to India to Africa. I didn't know that Paul Yonggi Cho has gone to so many places. We sh they showed us the video clip. He was the evangelist, just like Billy Graham. And just as I recall, Dr. DGS Dinakaran, the Billy Graham of India, he has passed away. He is known as the Billy Graham of India. But you know what today? God is redistributing His anointing through the body of Christ. The entire body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? The church, you and I. So it's just not just on a few people, it's on the entire church. So I'm going to talk about the Spirit-empowered church. In a sense, this term is a misnomer. There's no such thing. A church must be Spirit-empowered. If a church does not have the Holy Spirit, it's not a church. If a church does not have the Holy Spirit, it is not a church, it's just a gathering of people. So this is a misnomer. But I thought I just want to phrase it because no Holy Spirit, no church. The church was birthed by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And the church will end at the rapture, as we are told in Thessalonians, when He will be taken away. He, the Holy Spirit in the church, is taken away. Then the man of lawlessness will appear. The Antichrist will appear. So, what we're going to do is we need the Holy Spirit and we need the Holy Spirit by prayer. And at the end of today's service, we're going to anoint everyone. Everyone. If you're willing to be anointed. We're going to lay hands on your head and you're going to have an elder, a pastor, an intercessor, a senior leader praying for you. All right? And why do you need to pray it for? You will hear this message and you will understand. Broadly, to understand the work of the Holy Spirit, you must understand two broad ways He works. The Holy Spirit is God. He works in diverse manners. But specifically, we need to understand what we call the anointing in or the anointing within the believer and the anointing on or the anointing upon. And I want to explain to you why, all right? So what is this anointing in? The, this is the presence of God in the believer. The presence of God never leaves the believer. The anointing within the believer is permanent. It is forever. And the blood of Jesus covers the believer perfectly as contrasted with the Old Testament. That is why the Holy Spirit can dwell in the New Testament believer since Pentecost. But this was not so in the Old Testament because the blood covering of animal sacrifices were temporary. In the Old Testament, before Calvary, whenever they sinned, all right, they will bring a, a goat or a dove all right, to the priest. And the priest required the, the Israelite, the sinner, to lay his hands on the head of the sacrifice that is without blemish. 
as if to transfer his sin onto the sacrificial animal. And then the blood is shed. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us this blood covering by animals were temporary. Which is why the Holy Spirit cannot dwell, because He is the Holy Spirit. The blood of animals cannot cleanse their sins. It can only cover their sins. This is called covering or atonement. But since Calvary, when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became the Son of Man, was crucified and shed His blood for us and died, the precious blood of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God that took away and He can take away our sins by cleansing us and covering us forever. Which is why when we are cleansed and covered by the blood of Jesus, we are perfectly covered. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. Then the Holy Spirit, because He is holy, can now dwell in every believer. Don't ever take this for granted. Which is why we, when we come for corporate worship, we appreciate the Lord, we celebrate this victory. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we celebrate the victory. Because we are now called sons and daughters of God. We are adopted into the family of God. We are no longer strangers and aliens to the kingdom of God. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people to declare His praises. This is fundamental and this is so important. The presence of God is in the believer, in the spirit of the believer. 1 Corinthians 6.17 tells us that. The presence of God is with the believer wherever he is, Singapore, Zimbabwe, Togo, and whatever he may be doing. The presence of God is in us whether we sense him or not. I think of the businessman who is in Hong Kong and that evening he's got a hostess, a woman in his arms that is not his wife. He's a believer. And what he does is as the Holy Spirit conveys him, he's deliberately quenching the Spirit, deliberately shutting out the voice of the Spirit and continuing to enjoy the company of the woman, enjoying the sins. The Holy Spirit is with you as Pastor Jerry shared last week. When you're flirting with pornography at 2 a.m. in the morning. The Holy Spirit is with you when you go on an overseas holiday and you're not married and you're sleeping together and having premarital sex. The Bible calls that fornication. The Holy Spirit is with you even when you're committing adultery or when you're stealing. When you choose not to sense Him, when you choose not to, uh, to acknowledge Him, He never leaves you. The verse we read here, Jesus is called Emmanuel, God with us. In the Old Testament, His name is Jehovah Shammah. He is always with us, even in the valley of the shadow of death. So this is the anointing within. And for us, we understand this because this is the messages that have been preached over this pulpit. Point number five, the Holy Spirit is in us. We are temples of the Holy Spirit to instruct us, to guide us to know God, to walk with God, to hear God in our decision-making and seeking guidance from God. This is a discipleship. Our whole discipleship journey is to know the presence of God in us. The whole discipleship journey called sanctification is that this will produce holiness in us that we will be holy people, all right? Now, a lot have been preached about this. I will not dwell on this, all right? Just to mention this, I want to move on to the anointing on or the anointing upon the believer. The anointing in has got to do with the presence of God. The anointing upon us, on us, is the power of God working in and through that believer. So generally, when you use this term anointing, we are most of the time referring to the anointing on or the anointing upon. All right, did you receive the anointing and so forth, okay? The, this is also known in these various terminologies in the New Testament. So we're not going to quarrel with labels. In Ephesians 5.18, it's known as the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1.5, this is called the baptism with the Holy Spirit. We are being baptized. As you, are, as you jump into the swimming pool, you are being baptized with water, so to speak. As you are in the Holy Spirit, we are baptized, immersed, dwelt, by the Holy Spirit. Luke 24, 49, Jesus told the disciples, do not leave Jerusalem. Tarry around until you are clothed with power from on high. It's like the doctor wearing his white cloak. It's like the workman in the shipyard wearing his overalls. All right? Similarly, we are wearing and be clothed with power from on high. Acts 1, 4, this is known as the promise of the Father. 
In Acts 1.8, it says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you or comes upon you. The idea of wearing a cloak, wearing an overall. And in Acts 2 verse 4, when the Pentecost happened, it is described they were filled with the Holy Spirit. We see this anointing on in the Old Testament, very clear. The Spirit of God came upon Samson, the Spirit of God came upon various people to enable and to empower them to accomplish a work for God. Look at Gideon. In Judges chapter 6, we read that the people of Israel were frightened. They were raided by the Midianites who stole their wheat harvest, their grain harvest. They were hiding in the caves. There was so much fear among the Israelites. And God called a man called Gideon. And Gideon didn't believe God. He said, where is the God of the miracles? Where is the God of Moses who parted the Red Sea? If there is a God, why do the people of God cower in fear? And then the angel appeared before me. He asked for a sign. Okay, if you, you've already got, all right, all right. Uh, I put this fleece here, all right. Let there be dew on this fleece, but all around dry. Wow. When there's dew, dew is everywhere. Okay, dew only on the fleece, all around dry. It happened. Maybe by chance. No, 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 no. No dew on the fleece. Dew on the fleece. No, no dew on the fleece, but fleece all around. I mean, not fleece all around. <laughs> dry all around. All right, the other way around. And it happened so. Then Gideon knew this is of God. He offered, he built an altar to the Lord. The angel came into the fire and consumed that sacrifice and went into the heaven. And then what happened? He says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Gideon was empowered with boldness and courage. This is not just upon a man or a certain people. I think of the mother who needs to speak to a 17-year-old son who is taller and bigger than her. Physically, he could have whacked her. But a mother that is anointed will have authority and power to speak to, speak to a young man. Da, 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 da. I think of this incident which I shared with you before. About five years ago, six years ago, I was in Australia, south of Perth. I was speaking at this Aussie church camp. 98% all Aussies, they are all work people. They are plumbers, bricklayers, cement layers, build houses, carpenters, and so forth. And on the last day of the camp, there was this big burly guy, six feet three, six feet four, quarreling with his wife, shouting and screaming away. Then my contact, which is the Chinese lady, a petite Chinese lady, just about my shoulder's height. She turned around, I can't remember, the guy's name was John or Bob. John, stop it right now! You spirit of scoffer, get out. She was quoting Proverbs 22.10 as I understood later. Cast out the scoffer and the, and the strife will cease. Hug your wife now. And here is this burly man submitting to the authority. He hugged his wife. So I asked her, how did it happen? How come? All right, what happened? She explained to me Proverbs 22.10. Cast out the scoffer, every strife will cease. She has authority. It's not by physical size. She's empowered with bonus and courage. Jephthah, there was a time there when there was no leader in, in Israel, in Judges. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And they found one of the gangsters, one of the uh, gangsters called uh, Jephthah. Will you be our leader? Will you lead Israel in this battle? And Jephthah said, you really want me? In the past, you rejected me? You rejected me? I'm out of my family and so forth. And in the end, the, cut, cut the long story short, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah when the elder spirit over him and appointed him as a leader over Israel. He was empowered with leadership to war. We need leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. In the family, in the workplace, you need leaders who are clear-minded to know what to do, let's go. We need leadership now, all right, as we talk about this 40-day season of prayer. This coming July, I need leadership at the cell leader level, the spiritual parent level, the cell cluster level. How will you mobilize your cell group? How will you communicate to mobilize your people for prayer? Samson, he was endowed with supernatural strength. You know the story. He can tear the ropes that was around him. He can tear apart the jaw of a lion. And some of you mothers sitting at the back, I know sometimes they're so tired and weary. And what you need to do when you're so exhausted, ask God for strength. Ask God for physical strength. Ask God for emotional strength. When you find you're so drained, when you're so, you have exhausted every ounce of energy ministering to, uh, you are a caregiver to someone who is sick. You need strength. <clears throat> and that can come from the Lord. I was just looking at my schedule. I said, Lord, I need strength. This whole week that has just passed at the next two, three weeks, I've got four camps in the month of June. 
starting tomorrow, a, a leaders retreat of another local church, followed by a young adults camp, followed by another church camp, and so forth. All right, so I need strength. So I will cover and appreciate all your prayers. King Saul, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he uttered the oracles of God. We need to speak the Word of God into people's life. We need to speak the Word of God into each other's life, into our family, because we are all sons and daughters of God. This is not just meant for the elders, the pastors, etc. It's meant for the entire body of Christ to speak the oracles of God. The anointing on continues in the New Testament up to today. Pentecost makes a difference in the anointing upon. In the Old Testament, it just came upon a few men anointed by God to accomplish a work of God. But in the new covenant, it's available to every believer. So we ask the question, what is this anointing for? All right, um, This is to enable and the, empower the believer, firstly, to live victoriously. To live victoriously, to overcome the power of sin. Sin as contrasted with sins. Sin is the tree, sins are the fruits. Sins are the things that we do wrong. What we learned last week, adultery, fornication, lying, stealing. And sins are the things we ought to do, but we fail to do. Like honouring your parents, honouring your elders, honouring your leaders, respecting and submitting to your bosses, and so forth. So, you have seen this diagram many times, this is BPTC, uh, whatever, alright. This is Romans 7 and Romans 8 summarised. The law of sin and death is like gravity always pulling us down. Always pulling us down. And in the last two, three weeks I was just sharing, I have been dragged and tested on my patience. So what happened? In the law of my mind, in the law of our will, we try not to fall into sin. We try not to do those things. The law of sin and death is running and operating at, let's say, 100 kilometers an hour. But the law of our mind, the law of our will is only operating at 50 kilometers an hour. It's no match. We will fail. We think we may temporarily succeed, but we will fail. We need a higher law. And the higher law is the law of spirit of life. The law of aerodynamics or the law of uptrust overcomes the law of gravity. The law of the spirit of life is like 10,000 kilometers an hour. Easily overcome the 100 kilometers an hour. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome sin or pornography, or adultery, or a loose tongue, or our temper, whatever it is that you've been hearing. We need to be free from the sins of the past, <clears throat> a guilt, a shame, a stronghold. <clears throat> Perhaps you were molested when you were a sweet 16-year-old girl. And now you are in your 40s or 50s, and this incident is still bugging you. You have not got victory. Or some words were spoken to you by a teacher or a parent and you remember to this day, it has been a bondage. Or perhaps you stole something when you were young and you never got a chance to, to repent and make restitution. Or sins of the present, you're still addicted to pornography. You're still flirting with it from time to time. You're still giving in to temper and strongholds. And I really want to encourage you. The altar is always open. <clears throat> I want to encourage you, take advantage of the RTF that we, that we have every quarter. We had it in the last two quarters. The next one will be sometime in October. All right. Uh, come. All right. One Saturday will be a time of teaching and you're filling in the PQ, the, the questionnaire. And then three Saturdays later, you receive ministry from two persons, women to women, men to women. Don't miss it. We need to clean our lives. We need to deal with the things that hinder us. Then you will help us to overcome the world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I think of this guy, <clears throat> the love of money. Money is never enough. But the love of money has driven him, he has sucked away his time and energy, draw him away from God. Until he came to a point to realize what Paul meant, godly contentment is great gain. How much more? How much more? Talk to some mothers, uh, take care of your children. If possible, be a homemaker. Bring up your own children. The first five years, the first seven years are the most important of their lives. Advertising church camp. Church camp is June 2018. We just got the speaker, all right? Uh, he has, in principle, agreed. He will formally confirm by November. You're going to hear this message that is going to rock you out about kingdom living as contrasted with living from the culture of the world, okay? We're going to come up with a theme and so forth. Uh, the pride of life. 
We get our self-esteem from the Lord. Our self-esteem, our significance is not from the cars we drive, the places that we live, the whatever bags you're carrying. We, the Holy Spirit will help us overcome all this. Then you help us overcome the evil one. Luke 10, 19, we overcome all the power of the enemy. We need to guard two gates. There are two primary gates in our life. Firstly, is the gate of the mind. The devil is a liar, the Bible says. The devil is a deceiver. And if we cannot discern the lies and the deception, and we begin to entertain some of these ungodly beliefs, and ungodly thoughts is going to mess up your life. Similarly, our hearts. The Bible says, guard our hearts. The, our hearts is the other gateway to our soul and our spirit. Guard our hearts from the things that will, especially from guilt and condemnation. We must have a certain confidence most of the time, like today, coming into the presence of God to celebrate His presence, to rejoice in Him. But don't forget, the devil is shooting fiery darts, and some of these darts are laden with poison to sow guilt and condemnation so that we are immobilized, we are not even good for ourselves, not to talk about being good to be a blessing to others. The third area the devil operates very powerfully is fear. And we talk about this many a times. We must overcome all kinds of fears. And as you know, the mother of all fears is the fear of death. The opinion by the doctor, maybe this is cancer or heart attack, or your, mother, your muscle is going to atrophy, and so on and so forth. We must overcome the evil one. And the Spirit of the, of the living God will strengthen us. Fourthly, He will help us to overcome sickness and infirmities. Now, I've taken comfort in this big picture. <clears throat> Our salvation is in three parts. Firstly, when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, we are saved in our spirit. We are born again. We have the seal of the Holy Spirit guaranteeing we will be with God forever and forever. There's a second, this is called justification. The second part is we are being saved in our soul, in our personality. We are being changed. This is called discipleship. This is called being transformed into the image of Christ. This is called sanctification. We are being changed in the way we think, in the way we feel, in the way we decide and respond. And finally, we are not yet saved in our body, our physical body. This body is corrupt. This body is mortal. We await the day when we will have the incorruptible, immortal, resurrected body. In the meantime, this body is prone to aging. In the meantime, this body is prone to having soreness in the throat, or having legs that cannot walk, or having to change the knee or the hip, or face, or hair, all right, uh, and so on and so forth. So when we fall sick and so forth, temporarily recognize that this is the last enemy to be conquered. But in the meantime, what do we do? In the meantime, we turn to the Lord. In the meantime, we ask the Lord to help us to take care of ourselves physically. Telling a young man the other day, you need to sleep. You don't have enough sleep. All right? Or telling somebody else, you need to eat. You're so skinny. You need to eat chia, chia po. You need to eat more nutritious stuff. All right? Cut out all the junk food. And at the same time, pray. Like what, what, uh, what, what Paul prayed. All right? If the Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead, is in our physical bodies. He will give us strength. My next, I was just sharing, I need physical strength. I need emotional strength. I need spiritual strength. So are you. This is for every believer. And pray, Lord, your word is health to my body, to my flesh. Your word is strength to my bones. Strengthen my immunity so that you will not fall sick easily. We should most of the time not fall sick easily because this is, we are children of God. And that's why we need to learn to take care of ourselves physically, solically, and spiritually. So, what is the anointing for? The anointing is for us to minister the grace of God to other people. Every one of us. The anointing upon, the anointing on is meant for us outside the church. You're only in church on Sunday for two hours. You attend the sacred meetings for two, three hours, four, five hours with your supper and whatever. But most of the time, the anointing on is meant for us in the streets, on the MRT train, in the bus, in your office, in the homes. Ezekiel 47 talks about this anointing as the river of life. It first comes from the temple, underneath the temple, and it flows out of the temple. Initially, it was ankle deep, and then knee deep, and then waist deep, and then you got to swim. It goes out to the marshlands, 
It brings life to the plants. It brings life to the fishes of the sea. The anointing is meant for us to operate and minister the grace of God outside the church walls. Not just for us to feel good. Yes, we will feel good. We will be edified. We will be so encouraged. But we need to give. We need to give. You can only have more of God. You can only have more anointing when you give it away. Many people in the church do not get this. It is not just meant for the church to have a wonderful time and today we're going to lay hands on everybody and pray for everybody. All right? That is good. But it's meant to be given away. And when it's given away, you get more. That's why I do what I do. That's why the elders and the pastors do what we do. We must go out. We must go out, think of our pre-believing people. That's why we talk about this uh, Daniel Colander uh, 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 fire and wind uh, evangelistic healing rally. You must go out in the routines of our day in the workplaces. So that's what God did with Jesus. <clears throat> Father God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good. Ephesians 2.10, we are all saved, not by good works, but we are saved to do good works. Good works is primarily influencing and impacting lives. Good works is primarily to be so blessed to be a blessing to others. Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach, all right? You may not stand on the platform like me holding a mic, but you are supposed, we are all supposed to preach, we are all supposed to prophesy, we are all supposed to speak the oracles of God with friends, when you have your, you have your te tarik, when you have a, your roti prata, <coughs> when you have your mipota, all right, with your colleagues, when you go to McDonald's and you go to wherever, all right, and when you go to the restaurants, when you talk to the waitress, to the waiter, to the cashier, to the bus conductor, we have to heal the brokenhearted. There may be a lady colleague in your office, and you know of late, in the last few months, she's been feeling down, she's been crying in the toilets. We minister to her, she's brokenhearted. She's suspecting the husband is having an affair. We are supposed to proclaim liberty to the captives, those who are not sure what's going on. All this terrorism, all this violence, and people having tremendous fear. Recovery of sight to the blind, that means bringing sight to the spiritually blind. Share the gospel and set at liberty those who are oppressed, those who are in bondage. Church, we are anointed. The Lord wants to empower, enable every one of us to do this. Not just for the elders and pastors, this is for the entire body of Christ. <clears throat> then within the church, within the community of the church, 1 Peter 4.10, as each one has received a gift ministered to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. <clears throat> we are all stewards, the manifold grace of God, unlimited. We take the grace of God and we minister one at a time. And which is why the altar call is always open. We minister healing. We minister peace. We minister the wisdom of God for your work, for your businesses. We minister provision for those who, who suffer lack. We minister protection. All the aspects of the grace of God. Within the church, we are very familiar with this. There are different anointings for believers to fulfill their assignments. A leadership anointing enables you to provide direction. Everything rises or falls on leadership in the business world, in the school, in the hospital, in the church, in every team, in the family, leadership. In a situation where people are confused, not sure what to go, ask God for wisdom and the anointing of leadership to provide direction. Leadership is very closely related to an administrative anointing. It's very closely related to communication. I think of a second they were supposed to meet, but they did not meet because they did not know how the people are not there, they were at another meeting. Why? Poor communication. It's not clearly communicated both ways, all right? The members to the leader, the leaders to the members. We need leadership and leadership. You we come to church every Sunday, all right? You think everything is so nice. I don't know whether you noticed today, at the first few minutes, something did not go right. Hmm. Only two or three of you pick it up, several of you pick it up. There was a trip. A trip resulting in we cannot get the sound of the keyboard and the guitars up into the system. You can hear the drum very clearly and the bass. All right? And quickly, we thank God for all the skillful hands. They have to work and have a rehearsal every Saturday from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Right? And they have to ensure the system. You come, the couples are so, so nicely clean. The chairs are so nicely arranged. Why? 
Because there must be an administrative anointing upon our operations manager, upon uh, Pastor Daniel Ko, upon uh, Joseph Chia, and upon the cleaners and so forth. The toilets, why is this relatively so clean? An administrative anointing. The songs that we sing, you think it just, boom, let's produce the music. No, nothing is automatic. Everything requires, because our God is a God of order. Otherwise, it's going to be a mess. He's a God of order. And in everything that we do, we need to strategize, we need to be tactical, we need to plan. But we need an administrative anointing. In your cell groups, in your classes. And this is where we need the leadership and with those who are very skillful, they have the anointing to administrate, to lubricate the body life, to lubricate the communication. Oh, who is going to visit this sister? She's just been warded. Who is going to visit the other person? All right, uh, He's having some problems. Who is going to counsel this person? Who is going to go? If everything bothers next with just the leader, problem. Body life. If in this church you're not familiar, this church is an open brethren church. Rooted in the Word, connected to the Spirit. And we also boast of a phrase called the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers means that every one of us is a functioning believer. Every one of us is a priest and a king. Every one of us can be prayed. We can pray for ourselves, we can pray for our families, we can pray for other people. Every one of us can represent God to people. <clears throat> and every one of us can bring people to God. A healing anointing releases health. And you look at the 1 Corinthians 12 in the, uh, in the manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit. This is plural, plural. There are permutations and, and, and what's the other word? All right, of healings, miracles in the plural. Some may have a special gift to pray for back pain, some for cancer. The person who has gifting for pray for cancer may not have gifting to pray for headache or heart attacks. And so we need the entire body of Christ. And if I'm not well, I can pray for myself so much, but I need my brothers and my sisters to pray for me. And so I go to the pastors, I go to the other, lay hands upon me, lay hands upon me, pray for me. We need each, body, each other. None of us is complete and island to himself. We all need each other in the body of Christ. A psalmist anointing unlocks worship. And thank God for the worship team. Thank God for our worship pastor and, and the husband and, and, and all our worship leaders, all right? And for some of you who know, we, we, we need to change songs from time to time to go with the flow. And they had a hard time last night, all right? And all this is adjusted behind the scene. I just want to tell you, a lot of things goes behind the scene. But we need a summit on writing like on Pastor Jesse, on Joel, on Yuling, on Adrian, on Samuel, all right? And all the co-worship singers and all the musicians, and everyone, and at the tweaking at the audio level, at the visual level, and to get this screen uh, the way it is, all right, first of the full screen, and then now the three screens, and so on and so forth, everything requires skill. You go back to easy kill, uh, sorry, to Exodus, the same thing, how God anointed Bezalel with skill. He anointed the weavers to weave the garments of the priests. He anointed them as, as woodsmen, as craftsmen to build the temple, and the woodwork, the ironwork, the jewelry work, the tapestry, and so on and so forth. How to do that? The anointing. See, the anointing is when the super comes upon the natural. That's why you call it supernatural. In the natural, you are gifted. You may be very good people related. You may be very bright. You may be very articulate. Or you can be a businessman. You know how to make money. But you just depend on your natural, you're going to burn out. You need the anointing upon. Then the super comes upon the natural. A wisdom anointing eliminates uncertainty. Wisdom, Lord, give me insight into this situation. Why are there so much conflicts in this team? Lord, give me insight into this problem. How to unravel the problem? A wisdom anointing will just unlock it. One gram of God's wisdom will confound 10,000 tons of the world's wisdom. So never be afraid. Always go to the Lord. A prophetic anointing reveals the, the will of God. We ask the intercessors to pray. Ask God for downloads of words of knowledge. And you've been hearing that for the last few years in all the services. Specific words of knowledge, a prophetic anointing. But don't just say that, oh, I'm not an intercessor. It's for everybody. Ask God, Lord, what shall I share? What shall I speak to my wife, my husband, my son, my daughter? Speak into their lives every day as you pray for them every day. Don't wait for the special occasion and the special time. We who are parents, we who are married, we are in a family, and you are a child in the family, pray for your parents. 
the, uh, the unbelieving ones. Uh, and evangelist anointing releases the power of the gospel to save. Special anointing when they preach the gospel. And in fact, there is not only an individual anointing, it's a corporate anointing. Here for, for us in BBDC, it's very easy for every speaker to speak. I mean, yes, you need to prepare and sweat and so on, but it's very easy to speak. Some pl places when you go, when I go, when there's no corporate anointing, I tell you it's like pulling teeth. Very hard. You can have the most preparation and so on. And G we know this from the Bible. Jesus could not, did not do many miracles in his hometown because of their unbelief. Their unbelief caused the environment, the atmosphere to be non-anointed. So when we all come together as a people of God, when there is unity in our worship, when there's unity in our prayer, miracles will happen. That's how it happens. A teaching anointing brings clarity of the Word of God. How do you explain this? Uh, you know, I've been crucified with Christ. What do you mean crucified with Christ? Uh, unless you're born again. Uh, what do you mean by born again? Do I need to go back to my mother's womb? A question that Nicodemus asked. But you understand the word, you can explain. A pastoral shepherding anointing brings love, comfort, and encouragement. I was just remarking about a couple of cell leaders at a Saturday service, and the guy was so encouraged. This was one guy I know, and he would just go around taking note of every member in the cell group, visiting them, paying attention to their needs, and he'll be praying for them. He's there for them. Let me just summarize this part, all right? So this anointing within is permanent, what we talked about at the start, the presence of God. But the anointing upon is not permanent. The anointing upon, we need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. When you drive a car, after a week, after seven days, you must go back to the petrol station to top up, okay? When you are standing and working the whole day, all right, I just think my brother Jeffrey Go, he's teaching the whole day, he needs to go back and lie horizontal. <laughs> he needs to be filled up, he needs to be recharged. When he lies horizontal and sleeps, he's being recharged, he's being rejuvenated, he's being resurrected. <laughs> All right? We need to be continuously filled with the Spirit. It is never permanent. And this causes us to be always depending on the Lord. There are four postures to take. See, this is like I say, I want to emphasize this again. This is for every believer. And, and, and my goal and my aim is that we must all make this sustainable, doable on a day-to-day basis. So the four postures on the day-to-day basis. The first posture is the posture of obedience. Walk in obedience. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit in disobedience. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? When we get angry. What do you do? There is always hope. So what do you do? 1 John 1, 9. I'm losing my patience and ask for your forgiveness. That's all. Ask God for forgiveness and we will be forgiven. We are guaranteed forgiveness. Why are we guaranteed forgiveness? Because the blood has been shed. The price has been paid. Okay, so this is not a condemning message. I love this phrase by Pastor Jerry. This is not a condemning message. If I have got to do that, you have got to do that. All of us have got to do that. So when we are wrong, when we lose our temper, when we get angry, 1 John 1, 9. And ask the Holy Spirit to forgive you for grieving Him in your anger, in your covetousness, in being lazy, in being stingy, in stealing. And all this is mentioned from Ephesians 4 to chapter 5, verse 4 of Ephesians. All this is listed out from this passage. The second posture is the posture of flowing with the Holy Spirit. It's the idea of not quenching a flickering flame on a candle. Don't blow it out. It's the idea of a smoldering wick, all right? Not, not smoldering wick. A bruise, he says, a bruised reed he will not break. A bruised reed is a branch that is broken 98% and only hanging on with two threads. And you can easily just take it and break it completely. In Isaiah 42, he says that the Lord Jesus, in His mercy, in His compassion, when He pities us, and I love this word, God pities us sometimes in our misery, in our struggle. We ask for the Lord's pity. He says that He will not break us. He will heal us. He will restore us. Therefore, how do we quench the Spirit? We quench the Spirit when we are cynical. Oh, this Daniel Colander rally. Miracles, man. Really, man. <clears throat> the blind see. The deaf hear. Worship connecting with God. Really? God can't see. When we start mimicking, mocking, we are quenching the Spirit. 
where we are sceptical and cynical, it's, it's fine. There is a place for questions. I'm talking about the spirit, the spirit behind the cynicism and the skepticism. That's how we quench the spirit. We need to flow with the spirit, what the spirit is doing. All right? Thirdly, the posture of surrender. We can only be filled with the spirit when we surrender. When you lie down horizontal, you're surrendering. You can't do anything else, just sleep. And which is why the altar is always open. We say, no shame, no fear. Forget about your neighbor on your left and right. Just come, humble yourself to be prayed. And the fourth posture is the posture of earnest seeking and paying the price. At the conference, there was this Korean pastor. In his church, and he said, in Korea, and actually, I love the way of praying. He said, when you are hungry and thirsty for God, you cry out to God, Lord, save! Lord, help! Lord, intervene! He wants everybody to shout and scream to the Lord. I was just thinking to myself, BBTC, I said, pray aloud. Here, whispers here, whispers there. I love the Korean way of praying. I love the African way of praying. It's always loud. I love the Chinese way of praying. In the house churches in China, they really cry out to God. And so I was asking the Lord, how do we express our hunger and our thirst? And the Lord reminded us of our core value. Focus on the principles, don't major on the methodology. The methodology is to shout. And just this morning, we hunger and thirst for the Lord manifested in these three ways, BBTions. This is applicable and doable by all of us. Number one, in wanting to be a worshipper. Connect with God in worship. Don't come as a spectator. Connect with God in your heart. I was introduced to someone, I was told here he was very intellectual, very bright, very smart, very analytical. He will analyze and break down about worship, break into parts and so forth, all right? And then almost like got no feelings. So I posed a question, during worship, does anything else happen to you other than in your mind? He talked talk about here, but at the last part he says, caught my attention, he says, I cry. That is my answer. That's the answer I want to hear. That God can touch his heart. Hunger and thirst for God in worship. Number two, hunger and thirst for God in prayer. I cannot overemphasize. Husbands and wives, you must pray together. Cell groups, you must pray together. The singles, you must pray together. The single mothers, the divorced, the grandmothers, you are living alone, you must pray. All right? And there are many opportunities for prayer. And thirdly, you must get into the Word of God. You must hunger and thirst for the Word of God. You must get into the Word to stand upon His promise. The worship team can come on the stage. All right? So these are the four, uh, three primary ways we hunger and thirst for God. And this is the last verse I'm going to end. Today is Pentecost Sunday. <clears throat> How shall we live our lives? We live in a world that is fallen. We don't live in a world that is problem-free. I'm not talking about problem-free life, problem-free world, all right? John 16, 33, on the driveway of the church. In the world, you will have trouble. In the world, there will be tribulation. But it says, may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing. And I love this next line, that we will abound in hope, that we will increase in hope. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. All of us, every one of us, we need the anointing upon. And what we're going to do today, now at the end of the service, we're going to worship the Lord. And I want to give an opportunity for all the elders and the pastors and the intercessors and the leaders. What I'm going to ask them to do is to lay hands on you. At the Empower Conference, on the last night, I, mean, we were lined up, I was lined up in front and we had the anointing all. And there were a thousand over young people. Okay, and more, I, note, I can hear on my left and right the other pastors and all the big guns, so to speak, they pray fire more and more. And I said, Lord, how do you want me to pray to lay hands on your people? All right, what is the purpose of the anointing? Is to enable you and to empower you to live a victorious life. All right, so when the, when the young people came to me, when I laid my hands on their forehead, anointing them with all, and my left hand on their right shoulder, I whispered into their ears, and this just came out of my mouth. The first thing I say is, my brother, my sister, the Lord loves you very deeply. I didn't do anything else. Tears will start streaming down their eyes. You need to know the Lord loves you very deeply. Secondly, the Lord wants to empower you now. He wants to fill you with His Spirit to enable you, number one, to walk with Him. Because not every believer is walking with God. And the manifestations of walking with Him are the three things desiring to worship Him, connect with Him in worship, praying, getting into His Word. 
The Lord wants to enable and empower you to walk with Him and to serve Him, to be a blessing to others. And thirdly, I pray that you fulfill your destiny for your life. The Lord wants to give you a dream and a vision. The Lord wants to give you a dream and a vision and a purpose that is larger than life. You need to live for something larger than just going to work, coming home, eating, sleeping, and then the same routine day in and day out. You need to live for something larger. And for some of you, you are already impacting people, but there is more. Because God has given you the talent, the resources, the money, the brains, where you should be reaching out for a lot more. You're only operating at 30% capacity when you can hit another 60% capacity. You can double whatever you're doing now. I know I'm speaking to all of you, seven, eight hundred of you. Every one of us, we need to depend on the Holy Spirit in our living, in our walking with God, in our serving God, and to take this anointing out into the marketplace, in the schools, in our homes, in the streets, on the bus, in the MRT train, in the markets. And that's what we're going to do. Amen? Let's stand as we worship.